My voice is not in the best of shapes with all the traveling, but we are here together. Good morning this morning. We are Erev Chaf Av. Tonight, Chaf Av is going to be the 80th yard site of a great, great, great tzaddik, the one who fathered the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Schneerson. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Schneerson was a tzaddik with Mesirut Nefesh. As you certainly know, when the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe was in Russia, in communist Russia, he fought against communism and created an underground network of classes and schools and chadarim in order to be able to spread Torah in its holiness as Jews themselves wanted to to abolish any type of holiness in Judaism and wanted to sec- secularize all the Jews in order that they should become communists because the whole concept of communism is that Mother Russia is God and no one else. And therefore, any type of attachment to Judaism uh, was abolished and was fought against in such a way that anybody caught spreading Judaism, going to the mikveh, teaching students, uh, keeping mitzvot in an open way, was con- considered a counter-revolutionary, a, a counter-government, a, a type of uh, act action, and therefore would, they would be sentenced to death or sent to exile. And that's why the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, after being sentenced to death himself, and that sentence was transformed into an exile of 70 years, which eventually, thank God, he was able to leave Russia and arrived finally in America. <clears throat> But the only one of the dynasty of Chabad which stayed in uh, in Russia was the Rebbe's father. The Rebbe's father was very, very knowledgeable in all aspects of Torah, to say the least. He was at the the greatest depth, and uh, his particularity was that not only did he study the revealed aspect of Torah, but something which is a little uncommon in Chabad, he was a great Kabbalist. He was a great Kabbalist and he was able to, to take Kabbalah and bring it in a way that it, 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 it's practical to the, to, the, to, to the real life. Everything that he saw, he saw through the eyes of Kabbalah. He saw through the eyes of, of uh, the, the highest level of Torah. So I would like to share with you today uh, a little, first of all, of the relationship between father and son, to share with you a little of his life, and to share with you a few of his teachings. So like this, we get a glimpse at this giant, in, 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 in this giant's life, a glimpse in this giant's life. I will say that uh, the Rebbe had teachers And these teachers, uh, very quickly, at a very young age, were surpassed by the Rebbe himself. So who became the Rebbe's teacher? His father, right? There's a mitzvah, mitzvah, it's a mitzvah on a father to teach his son Torah. So he taught him Torah. And you can imagine that at a very young age, the Rebbe not only was proficient in all aspects of the revealed aspects of Torah, but even in the secrets of Torah, the, the Rebbe was, was already very, very knowledgeable at a very young age. There's one particular story which gets me at my core each time I say it. It's the story of Reb Levi Yitzchak. Reb Levi Yitzchak was the rabbi of Yeketran Yislev. And obviously, he had a lot of simple people that would come to him. But because of his great knowledge and his very deep uh, uh, understanding of Torah, it didn't mean that he wasn't going to share the deepest thoughts. So one day a Hasid was coming by the city of Yekutran Islev and spent over their Shabbat, and he heard Reb Levik speak to the crowd. And as he was speaking to the crowd, this Hasid thinks in his mind, who is he speaking to? Nobody can understand what he's saying. 
So he turned to Rablevik after his speech and asked him, who are you talking to? Who understands even what you're saying? So Rablevik pointed and said, you see this young man in the corner? It was his son, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, as a young boy. And he said, he understands everything that I'm saying. But there's another story which really gets me even more to my core. And that's the story that uh, Reb Levik was giving over, a drasha, was giving over his speech, his talk, talk. Now, you have to understand that one of the particularities of Reb Levik is that he would intertwine all aspects of Torah together. We'll see in a later, uh, later years uh, he writes to his son, to the Rebbe, uh, that to make sure that when he studies Torah and, he, and, and he, he develops a concept in the revealed aspect of Torah, he should try to find the Shoresh, the, the root in Kabbalah, and connect them both so that this, every aspect of the Torah, every facet of Torah should, should, should be blended together and create this tapestry which is exact and precise. He would intertwined the Zohar, the Midrash, the Talmud, the commentaries of the Talmud, and, and, uh, and, and different Kabbalistic works, and so on and so forth, in one drasha, in one speech. After his speech, the Hasid recounts that he was there, and Reb Levik asks his young son to give by heart, the references to quote all the quotations and the references, he should, he should recite them. So, what does that look like? Uh, Reb Levik must have spoken, let's say, for half an hour, 40 minutes. Maybe in his 40 minutes he quoted at least 30 to 50 different places, different, uh, different uh, citations from the Zohar, from different places. And here, the young boy, which himself was proficient in every area of Torah, starts quoting. And he says, <laughs> let's say, uh, the, the, the tractate of Psachim on page 26b, and the tractate of uh, Ktuvot on page 117a, and the Zohar in Parashat Beshalach, and then the Midrash in Bereshit Rabbah Lamed Vav, and, and so on and so forth. He would give all these quotations. Imagine, it's just like you, you we, we are listening to a speech, <laughs> and, and the Rebbe is seeing all the references, where exactly it's coming from, the root of everything. So a Hasid approaches the Reb Levik and says to him, I don't understand. <laughs> you're the one that gave the drasha, you're the one that gave the speech, you don't know which references are. What does it add to you that your son is not going to give the references? I mean, what exactly is this for? To show how proficient your son is. What exactly are you trying to do? Listen to this answer. We know that a statement in the Talmud sometimes appears in three different contexts, in three different masechtot, three different tra tractates. Sometimes a statement that's in the Talmud will appear as well in the Zohar, in different places, and in the Midrash. He says, when I was speaking, I intended to the, this quotation in this context, and that quotation in that context. But my son, when he heard my talk, he understood that I was quoting another place, in another context, in another context. So now my drasha, my speech, which I gave, takes a new face altogether. It's like a new understanding. It's like I'm listening to my own drasha, but in another light altogether. <laughs> if you realize what that means, it's extraordinary. Here we see, at the same time, greatness and humility. Greatness in the sense that you have a way to look at things and create this extraordinary tapestry, extraordinary tapestry of of, of knowledge 
intertwined in a perfect way, sewed up in a perfect way, and suddenly somebody gives you a flavor that's much deeper than whatever you thought about. And therefore, the Rebbe, one day Rabbi Butman was in Paris, and the Rebbe was in Paris to visit his mother. And Rabbi Butman, of blessed memory, which knew the Rebbe's father, said to the Rebbe, your father told me that you surpassed him a long time ago. So the Rebbe's answer was, that's the way a father has to speak about a son. Rabbi Butman retorted right away, that's the way a son has to speak about his father. I'm just going to make a little parenthesis here because there's something that irks me very, very deeply in this generation. And I think that from that relationship of father and son, we can learn so much. Today, they have what's called digital dimen d d d d dementia. Kids have digital dementia. It's a new, a new sickness. Everybody at a, every free time we have, we, 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 we turn to the cell phone as if, you know, before the cell phone, we have to turn to something else, to playing games or to, to, uh, to reading or to talking, you know, talking. Remember, face to face. <laughs> So, today, we turn to all these different things to be able to keep our minds busy. But look how a father actually gets involved with his child, and instead of having, excuse my language, a pea brain, and saying, you know what, these aspects of Torah are not for my son yet or my child. These very deep discussions are not yet for him. He'll learn it in yeshiva or whatever, in seminary or whatever it is. And at the end, the child does not feel a fulfillment because he wants, there's a, Eretz Refetz, we are called a desired land, just like in a land, in the earth, there are treasures, everyone has their treasure at a very young age. Believe it or not, I think the children are, are actually more intelligent today and they're more sharp. And because of their sharpness, that's why they, their, their, their curiosity and, and they, they're looking for something that's going to satiate their brain, just like a person wants to eat a meal that's going to satiate them. But we're not giving them that. We're saying, you know what, we're going to teach you very superficial. We're not going to go to the depth Imagine what your table would look like. Imagine what your relationship with your child would look like if from the onset you, the discussions you had were deep discussions. Even if it touches Kabbalah, even if it touches Hasidut, and even if it touches the deepest aspect of, of, of Nigle, of the, of, of, uh, the Talmud, and, and, and various issues through the lens of Torah. You know how these children would uh, grow <laughs> grow and, 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 and be, be satiated and, and feel a greater curiosity. But unfortunately, we seem to just, you know, we, uh, we don't want to push too much. Push too much what? If you're excited about it, if you go to the depth yourself, you want to share that depth, and the child is going to, you know, feel that connection. Actually, it says about Yosef at Sadiq. Yosef HaTzadik went down all the way to Egypt. He was tempted by a woman. He was in jail. He, 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 he was tempted by money. He was tempted by his looks. He was tempted by every sub single temptation and had every excuse in the book to say, you know what, hey, I'm a 17 years old, the prime of my age. I lost my mother at nine. I got sold at six, 17. You know, I got sold uh, uh, by my brothers. Everybody think, you know, I, he could have sinned, but he didn't give that excuse to himself. When his father finally reconnects with him, what reconnects them? The last thing they studied in Torah together. 
ונפשו קשורה בנפשו, it says about בנימין and יעקב. One of the commentaries says the word קשורה is the numerical value of Torah. The real connection we have is when we have these deep discussions, when, when not only it's just the superficial stuff, that's, that's the physical stuff, but the spiritual connection. So I just want to add, that was just uh, something that's on my, sitting on my heart, so I, I, I need to express myself. Uh, Reb Levik was a great, great Baal Mesirut Nefesh. He was uh, somebody that uh, went to the greatest extents to protect Judaism in its authenticity, even though the, the Russian government was paying rabbis right and left to, to be able to do and be their puppets, he, he wasn't ready to do that, and therefore, uh, being such a recognized rabbi, uh, they needed his stamp of approval on, uh, on the matzot, which was a very, very big deal at the time. You can imagine how many Jews lived, and, uh, and that was a, a great production, and the government uh, threatened him that he better put his stamp of approval on Matzot. He says, if it's not kosher and if I don't send my rabbis to approve it, I will not, I will not give my stamp of approval. Eventually, he went to the head office and he was able to, to, to convince them that they, they better, better, better uh, accept his stamp of approval, you know? So, to share a little thought of Rab Levik. You know, the Torah has a body, the Torah has a soul. We have a body, we have a soul. The, the body of the Torah is the details of the laws that we do, the practices we do, the revealed aspect of Torah, how to put on tefillin, when to, when to, to, to light the Shabbat candles, how to do it, and all the how to and what to and which parameters, just like the body, you know, the body needs water, the body needs bread, the body needs this, and so on and so forth. But then there's the soul. The soul is the true life of the person, right? A person without a soul, just like Adam Arishon, when he was just a golem, he was just a, a, a piece of mud, right, of clay. In God's hands, he was nothing. His whole life had a sense once the soul came into the body, and then he became another being altogether. The Torah itself, if it's void of the secrets of Torah, the soul of Torah, which is Hasidut and Kabbalah, then we only reach a certain limit, you know? All the coaches around the world and everything, with everything they offer and all the therapies and so on and so forth, as good as they are, they deal with the psyche, they deal with the body, they deal with things which are limited. Once you connect to Torah, to holiness, to godliness, you are taking another dimension. You are elevating everything to another level. The same thing in the study of Torah. We could study the different machlokot, the different discussions and disputes in the Talmud between the rabbis at a first basic level, or we could take it to another level altogether, which is the root of things. And here I would like to invite you to a little journey, a quick one, uh, but a journey in understanding the depth of Torah through the eyes of Rev Levik. We know in the Talmud there are two rabbis which are the prominent rabbis which the, the whole Talmud is basically based on their teachings. They are mentioned 1,500 times in the Talmud. These are the rabbis of Abaye and Rava. Out of the 1,500 times, Abaye and Rava argue 500 times approximately. Out of the 500 times, the law, which means the conclusion of the discussions, ends up being like Abaye only six times according to another opinion, maybe nine times, six times. So out of 500 times, the halakha is like Abaye six times, and all the rest, the 494 times, <laughs> like, uh, like uh, Rava. So, at first glance, we need to understand why is it like this. And Rashi 
in his commentary of the Talmud, says that these six machlokot, these six discussions, or the, 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 the first letter of each one, each one of these discussions form the words Ya'el Kagam. Yud Ein Lamed Kuf Gimel Mem. I'm not going to go into this now because it's not relevant. I just wanted you to have the concept noted in your mind. So let's examine. He says, uh, I believe he says, one second, let's go. let's go to the depth of things and let's try to understand why is it like this. So instead of looking from down to up, we're going to look from up to down. What I mean to say, Reb Levick is going to go and say, one second, what is the Shoresh Neshama, right? We all have a certain tendency. I have eight kids, Baruch Hashem, God bless them, and I've been blessed. And each one has a different nature, right? Each one has a different nature. One is more sensitive, the other one's more intellectual, the other, each one is more inquisitive, the other one's organized, this one I still didn't find, but anyways, you know, so everyone has a different nature. <clears throat> but it's not only the nature of the body, of the intellect, of the person, there's the nature of the soul which guides us. So Reb Levick says, okay, what is the root of the soul of these rabbis which are talking? Obviously, the discussions which are happening down here are a reflection of something of a more spiritual nature. So he explains like this. There are what we call two types of makif. We know that there is a light, the light of Hashem, the way Hashem interacts with His world, His creation. There are different levels of involvement. An involvement which is more pnimi, which is more involved, is the way that Hashem's light, which is called memale kol almin, the one that fills the world, where God brings vitality in a particular way to everything according to its nature, according to its parameters, according to its limitations. Just like there's a certain uh, uh, level of blood, right, the, the, that, that's in the, the head, that, that's not the one that's in the heart, and the rest that's in the, the, the legs, right? That's why we have thinner, uh, the, the more thin blood goes to the head. We have thinner... Uh, veins and so on and so forth everything according to its capacity but then there's a level of vitality which is higher than nature it's something which surrounds you in that level of vitality right you have a level of vitality which is within your reach and you have one which is above your reach in the language of Kabbalah, Rablevik defines this as makif hakarov, a surrounding light which is close to you, and makif harachok, a surrounding light that's above reach. Okay? So he says, Rava, the source of his soul, comes from where? It comes from the level of of light, which is the surrounding light, but which is within your reach. Well, Abaye is from a higher level of light, which is out of your reach. And now that we have this concept pretty clear, let's delve into the Talmud and look with these binoculars, with this uh, uh, magnifying glass, let's examine what the Talmud says in Brachot. I think it's page 42, if I'm not mistaken. Over there, Rabba not Rava, Rabba, which was the uncle of Abaye. Abaye was a, 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 an, or, an orphan. Abaye and Rava are both from the house of Eli Cohen. They're sitting down in the classroom. Rabba says to both of them, Lemi mevachim. When we have to say Birkat Amazon, you have to bench. Who do we bless? They both say, Rachmana. <laughs> To God, obviously we bless God for the food. Where is God? Comes Rabba, Rava, 
and he points at the ceiling. He says, look at the ceiling. Abaye goes out of the house and he points at the sky. So at that moment, Rabah gets all excited and he says, Butsin, Butsin, Katfe Yediya. What does that Butsin, Butsin, Katfe Yediya mean? He says, the zucchini, when it starts growing, as soon as we see it, the way it starts to grow, you know that it's going to be good. I see both of you and you are going to be G'dolei Israel. You're going to be geniuses and leaders of the Jewish people and subjects of Torah. What's the connection? Reb Levik continues and brings us a Talmud from Rosh Hashanah, page 18, if I'm not mistaken. We know that both of them, as we said earlier, were from the house of Elia Cohen. Elia Cohen was a very holy Jew at the time of the temple. But his children were not really behaving in a proper way. His children desecrated, the, 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 they didn't respect people, they didn't respect uh, the korbanot, the sacrifices. Therefore, a decree from heaven came that all his descendants should die by the age of 20. So the Talmud asks a question. <laughs> Both Abaye and Rava are from the house of Elia Cohen. Rava lived for 40 years, while Abaye lived for 60 years. How come? The Talmud answers, Rava studied Torah in a very involved way. Therefore, he married it an extra 20 years. That's why he lived for 40 years. Ah, so Abaye, what did he do? Not only did he study Torah, which gave him 20 years, but he did Gminut Chasadim, he was benevolent, therefore he got another 20 years. He lived till 60. Comes at Levik. Listen to this one, guys. And says, one second. What is 40 and what is 60? 40 is the letter Mem. 60 is the letter Samech. So if you look at the letter Mem, the way the Mem is, is like a square. The letter Samech is like a circle. He says, that's what we're saying. Rava, which represents the surrounding light that's in your reach, is like a square, a mem. Ra, uh, Abaye, which is, represents the source of his soul, is the level of the surrounding light which is above your reach. He's like a samech. It doesn't have stability. It's a samech is round. Therefore, you understand why when the rabbi asked him, Who, where is he? Where is Hashem? One pointed to the square, which is the house, inside the house, while the other one went outside to something which is higher. So now we understand that if we take all the discussions between the rabbis, what are the lenses, what are the binoculars, what are the glasses through which they look at Torah? They look it through their soul. So I'm going to give you another example, just so like this we can grasp this in a very practical way. And by doing so, what's going to happen is that you understand that the study of Talmud now takes another dimension. You bring soul in the Talmud. In Baba Metzia, it talks about what's called about Yehush. Yehush, somebody forgoing the ownership of an object because he gave up on it, because he lost it. Do we say Yehush Elomidat or do we don't say Yehush Elomidat? Which means like this. We have, let's call him Shimon. Shimon had a pen. And the pen, he was walking in, uh, in uh, uh, Kew Garden Hills. Thousands of people walk in Kew Garden Hills. And he lost his pen. There's no sign on the pen identifying that it belongs to Shimon. It's a simple pen. 
So now the question is, somebody finds a pen, this pen, finds this pen. So the question is, does it belong to him? Or is Shimon still an owner? So one opinion says that as long as Shimon did not realize that he lost his pen, it still belongs to him. And therefore, anybody grabbing this pen is actually grabbing something which belongs as an object that belongs to somebody else. But according to another opinion, even if he didn't realize that he lost the pen, since he is going to for sure forego the ownership of this pen and give up on it because it was in such a public area that he lost it. So it's considered as if even though he doesn't know, it's already, he gave it up. And therefore, taking it at any time is not stealing. Rava says, I hope you still get me with what I'm saying. Rava says that even if he does not know that he lost the object, since he will give up for sure, there's no pos- there's no iota of a possibility, or it's very, very minimal, the possibility of him finding his pen. Therefore, he already, before he knows that he lost the pen, it's considered already as lost. That's the opinion of Rava. The opinion of Abaye is there's a remote possibility that maybe 1% chance that he'll find it. Therefore, till he, 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 he gives it up and he finds out that he lost the pen, then it's com- considered lost. You understand the difference? One is a reality, which is the reality. The reality is that he lost his pen. There's no chance, a very minimal chance, that he is going to find it. Therefore, before he finds it, that's Rava. Rava is somebody which is the reality which is close to you, just like the house, just like the mem. Abaye is ready to find even a reality which is very remote, very not possible. That's the reality he lives in. And therefore, in this specific halacha, he says it's possible. There's a small possibility that Allah is like him. What does that lead us to? Leads us to the fact that we should stop looking at things in a superficial way. Rabbi himself got exiled five times. He explains according to Kabbalah why five times, why at this specific date, what his name is according to Kabbalah, what the name of the mother is. Everything is precise. When you go, it's like the difference between the feet and the brain. Right? Everything in the brain is very, very, very precise. A little cut on the, on the hand, God is nothing. A cut on the, in, uh, or a small cut inside the brain could affect everything. Rabbi Levik lived at the level of the soul, at the level of the brain. He lived at the level where he understood the closer you are to Hashem, the more every detail counts, every detail is precise, every detail is a revelation of God's will. Every person in the Talmud illustrates another facet of Hashem. So the lesson we can learn from Rabbi Levik, which tonight is going to be his 80th yard site, and it says on the day that there's a yard site of a tzaddik, of a righteous, holy Jew, right? this is the time that all that he has done right, comes down in reality, in this, in this reality of this world. And whoever is connected to him, and we are all connected to him because today we study his Torah together, we all benefit of his great merits. And what greater merit than to bring in the world to Father the Lubavitcher Rebbe and everything that's he transformed the world and continues to do so to his shuchim and everyone in the world and his teachings. So Bezat Hashem, I would like to offer that every single one of us go out of his limitations and uh, don't, don't be scared of the Talmud. Don't be scared of Kabbalah. Don't be scared of Hasidut. Whatever you, you feel, you want to learn deeper 
don't satisfy yourself with only the, 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 the box. Don't be a robot. Don't be in the box. There's much more to the box that Hashem offered us. And that's what the nations of the world, why they're so jealous of us. And that's what we have. So let's maximize our study of Torah. Let's maximize the depth of our Torah and the quality of our involvement. Mezat Hashem Yidbarach. May we merit very, very, very soon. Already tonight, Chaf Av, which is going to be 40 days from Rosh Hashanah. So this is the time to prepare ourselves for Bezat Hashem, a good year. A year, Tav Shin Pehe, Shin Pehe, 5785. Right? Uh, 785 is 5785. Shin Pehe, which is 385. Right, is uh, the numerical value of um, Shechina, God's presence. So may we merit God's presence to be with us, to accompany us. And Bezat Hashem Mashiach now. Shabbat Shalom to everyone and thank you for joining us.